everybody sit please we want to get started so the girls can go back to their classes so boy and the rest of you can do whatever else you do in the afternoon my name is Gina Brewer I'm president this year of the Marin Women's Political Action Committee and I welcome everybody to our annual luncheon which is always a lot of fun and we hope that you all get a chance to mingle and meet new people and we welcome the students who are here who are the student leaders they all have very impressive uh, credentials and Barbara Heller will go over that in a little bit um, first of all there are tickets for sale for the uh, raffle you can see all the prizes and there's Ed he's in charge yeah and there's lots of good stuff there so be sure and buy some tickets okay um, first of all we're going to introduce all the elected officials so when I call your name wave or stand up or whatever you feel like doing Judy Arnold She's not here Esther Byrne, San Rafael City Clerk. <laughs> Megan Clark, Las Galinas Valley Sanitary District member. <laughs> Kate Collins, San Rafael City Council. <laughs> Diana Conti, Trustee, College of Marin. <laughs> Alice Fredericks, Tiburon Town Council. Catherine Hilliard, Southern Marin Fire District member. Linda Jackson, San Rafael School Board member. Madeline Kellner, Novato City Council member. Pam Miggs, is she here? There she is. Ross Valley Sanitary District. Stephanie Moulton Peters, Mill Valley. Stephanie O'Brien, Trustee, College of Marin. <laughs> Katie Rice, President of the Marin Board of Supervisors. <laughs> Pat Warren, County Board of Education. <laughs> Catherine Way, Larkspur City Council, Vice Mayor. Uh, is Vivian here? Barbara Heller, San Rafael City Council, retired. <laughs> Carol Dillon Knudsen, is she here? She's Nevada City Council, retired. Joan Thayer, County Assessor, retired. And Joan Lissiter, retired. <laughs> Doesn't say <see> from what. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, a few good men. Yeah, Frank. One more, Gina. <laughs> Cynthia Kohler. Oh, Cynthia, Cynthia Kohler. of course. Hi, Cynthia. Yes, I just saw her. Cynthia Kohler with the um, Marin Water District Board. <laughs> Any other women missing in action? No. Okay, Frank Egger, Ross Valley Sanitary District. Um, is Wesley here? Ah, okay. He's representing Congressman Jared Huffman. <laughs> Carol Mills representing Senator Mike McGuire. <laughs> Joan Lubomirsky. Is she here? Not yet. Okay. Greg Nell. Um, Sandra, let's see, handwriting here. Okay, school board member. San Rafael, okay. <laughs> See you. Okay, anybody else that we need to acknowledge? Because we do, we do appreciate. Greg, Greg Brockbank. Yeah, I thought of. Okay, Greg, ret retired uh, San Rafael City Council. Among other things. Okay. 
Barbara Heller is going to come up and introduce our student leaders. She's vice president of our organization. Thank you. This proves that uh, when you retire from one organization, they force you into another one. <laughs> However, um, we're more fun? Yeah, I'll, I'll vote for that. <laughs> Having retired from the San Rafael City Council after 20 years, um, it is a lot of fun to be retired, but I miss it as uh, all of you women who are working hard know it is a lot of work. And uh, I've been asked to introduce the student leaders, and I just want to do my disclaimer right now. I've been practicing these names for three days, and I will still mispronounce some, and I apologize in, in, uh, uh, before I start. Anyway, we have a lovely, lovely group of uh, women who are here today from one, two, three, four, five, six different uh, five high schools and College of Marin. And, um, and, uh, well, San Domenico's a high school? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, uh, anyway, oh, college, college of Marin. College of Marin. San Domenico, two colleges. The rest high school. Okay. Oh, Dominican University, I beg your pardon. Got it. Okay. College of Marin, we have Diana Arnold, ASCOM Director of Public Relations. If you could just stand for us, thank you. Catalina Sancom, Student Ambassador. Is Catalina here? Catalina. Amanda Senewaka, got it close. Alpha Gamma Sigma Artistic Director. Mariana Weber, State Student Senate Representative. And Dominican University. Is it Krisha? Carlos, I didn't see you when you walked in. Krisha Collins. Just came in. Katherine Koifman, representative to Political Science Student Association. Krisha Carlos was the director of volunteers for the Institute for Leadership Studies. Tara Linda High School, where are you, Tara Linda? Yay. <laughs> Megan Aquilino, you know, we, uh, WIS Commissioner. Annie Best, ASB Board Representative. Carmela Bion, ASB President. <laughs> Natalie Sessi, Natalie Sessi, ASB Vice President. San Rafael High School, where both my daughters graduated. Where's San Rafael? There we are, good. San Rafael High, uh, Colleen Conradi, Associated Student Body Spirit Commissioner. Jay Daly, freshman class president. Yay, Jay. Johnny Lee Fain, mock trial. And then Brownwin Lane, senior class president. Sir Francis Drake High School. Where's Sir Francis Drake? Up oh, there they are. Okay. Uh, Cameron Ashton, mock trial captain, student great student advisory member. Zoe Harris, Associated Student Body Vice President. Anna Repture, Junior Class President. And San Domenico High School. Back over here, okay. Eliza Bernstein, and she's the Student Council Vice President. Ashley Mosenock, uh, Student Council President. Anyway, thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you all sitting up here in just a few years. <laughs> um, I want to remind the students that there's proclamations over there from um, Congressman Huffman and uh, State Senator Mike McGuire in your names. So be sure and pick up your um, proclamations. And there's a couple of girls who ended up not being able to come, but we have proclamations. So if that's one of your people, please pick up for her. And then um, we're going to do a group shot, a group picture afterwards. So don't run away. 
until we do that. But we'll try and get everything done pretty quickly. So thank you. So everyone enjoy your meals and then we'll start the program in a little bit. Have our speakers start now. We are pleased to have with us today Betty Yee, a member of the Democratic Party, a newly elected California State Controller. She, she previously served as a member of the California Board of Equalization and won an open seat for controller in the, two, in the 2014 election with 53% of the vote. A native of San Francisco, Betty was born to immigrant parents who established a laundry and dry cleaning business in the Parkside District of San Francisco and operated it for 30 years. The second oldest of six children, Betty grew up speaking no English at home. As with her siblings, when not in school, she worked the counter of her parents' business, interacting with customers, translating <coughs> with vendors, as well as assisting in financial transactions for them. She attended the University of California, Berkeley as an undergraduate, uh, achieving a degree in sociology, then went on to Golden Gate University, where she earned a master's degree in public administration. She served as Governor Gray Davis's chief deputy director for budget with the California Department of Finance, where she led the development of the governor's budget, negotiations with the legislature and key budget stakeholders, and fiscal analysis of legislation on behalf of the administration. Um, and she also held several senior staff positions on various committees with the California State Legislature. In, tw in 2004, she became the chief deputy to Board of Equalization member Carol Migdon and was appointed to fill that seat when Migdon vacated it after being elected to the State Senate. And she was elected to her own right in 2006. Betty continues to demonstrate a strong commitment to mentoring and supporting women, youth, and those from our diverse communities of color who are seeking to enter or pursuing opportunities in public service. She currently serves on the Board of Directors of California Women Lead, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to providing leadership training, network opportunities, and policy discussion for women serving in elected or appointed offices. She also has participated in numerous leadership trainings and conferences uh, sponsored by such organizations as Emily's List, Emerge California, the Asian Pacific American Leadership Project, and the Women's Caucus of the California Democratic Party. Please join me in welcoming Betty Yee. Thank you, Gina, very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I can't tell you how good it feels to come back to Marin County and to personally thank this organization, but so many of you, for this tremendous victory to where today I stand as the 32nd State Controller for the State of California. So. And, and part of why I really try to make this luncheon every single year is because um, I think uh, Marin women really understand what it means uh, when we say uh, women supporting women. And uh, not only in terms of the great numbers of elected women that you have serving uh, our county, our cities, our special districts uh, here uh, in this region, but uh, also the young student leaders that you bring uh, to really introduce them to uh, a path to uh, public service and to serving uh, beyond their, their high school and college years. And so I'm just thrilled to always be a part of this, uh, this gathering. Uh, but I want to just do a couple of shout outs because obviously um, this um, race was um, challenging, uh, but I have to say it was a journey of a lifetime. Uh, but it could not have been possible but for really a lot of women, and I'll, I just want to name several, who were just with me from day one on the ground here, uh, who just believed that we had a shot at this and that if we uh, uh, kept our nose down and did the work that we had to do, and women as women, we always have to double prove ourselves, and so uh, we just continue to do that. But uh, just so grateful for the tremendous support that I have here. Uh, first, um, Cynthia Kohler, who's been with me through all my races. <laughs> That's from Water District. And of course, Barbara Holler, who I think uh, has probably mentored more women in this region than, than anyone. And uh, someone who I've uh, just really grown uh, to have been a former colleague with, uh, but she continues to uh, just continue to be out here and just supporting uh, what we're doing in terms of elevating uh, the representation of women. That's uh, uh, retired uh, county assessor Joan Thayer. 
Now, among the activists uh, in, in this crowd, I mean, Dottie Lemieux, I mean, Barbara Matas, uh, everyone who's here, Carol, um, this is what it takes to win elections. And uh, I know that Marin continues to shine with respect to voter turnout, although we have to do better by that everywhere. Uh, Marin continues to shine in terms of uh, uh, supporting uh, your own candidates uh, running for statewide office. And uh, I was just speaking with um, Nancy Skinner um, as we were having lunch about uh, how we really do want to see more of you uh, elevating to state level offices. And she's going to give you a, a little bleak picture about what's happening at the state level that really uh, needs to change because uh, we have so many challenges affecting this great state. And uh, I'm here to tell you that as the seventh largest economy, it moved up from eighth when I was running for office, now the seventh. And uh, I'm not going to take credit for that because I didn't have much to do with that. But, but, but it, it does say that you know the, the great work that Nancy and her colleagues did with the governor to really bring some discipline in terms of our fiscal house. Uh, is, and, and, and I'd like to always thank the voters for uh, approving Proposition 30, which really uh, helped a long ways with respect to additional revenue, even though on a temporary basis to really help bring us budget stability. And with that, uh, we are in a very, very strong cash situation uh, right now. The February cash report was just beyond. It was a billion dollars over the governor's uh, assumption on revenue. And uh, with that, uh, we hope that uh, by the end of, between now and the end of the fiscal year, we will not have to go out to the market to do any external borrowing, which is great because we will save on our borrowing costs uh, relative to that. So thank you, Nancy, and to the, your colleagues for just having the great discipline to get us here. And then really to all of you serving in local government because you had to really incur a lot of the sacrifices. You know, when the state could not be kind to you, this is where really a lot of decisions about rubber meeting the road is uh, where it happens. And so uh, we know that there are real impacts, particularly to our lower income families, to our students, and uh, to people like Diane Conti who's just trying to you know, make things work relative to just young people wanting to uh, see a future and have an opportunity. So, uh, but this is where really the hard work gets done and so, uh, which is why I think uh, we really just need to uh, encourage many of you here who are on your journey locally to uh, continue to improve the quality of life in your communities here to think about doing that for the state as a whole because we need you. Uh, the woman's voice is very important. The women's perspective is very, very important in terms of our public policy debates. And uh, frankly, I think it's a fuller debate when women are at the table because uh, we know that we're not just focused on ourselves. We're focused on our communities. We're focused on our entire state. We're focused on society as a whole. And, uh, and because of that, the decisions that we're, we get to be a part of really have much more broad-ranging impact. So uh, I'm just thrilled to think about the possibilities, of particularly looking into the eyes of these young leaders who are here, uh, to just uh, hopefully have you think about that as you leave today, how uh, along your journey you can become more involved with public service and one day uh, think about running for office. So uh, I just want to take a couple minutes to just tell you about, um, wow, two months on the job now. It's uh, been really an exciting time. I am enjoying it. It is uh, the, the geekiness in me is just coming out every day. And uh, uh, so from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And, and the buzz in the elevator in Sacramento has been, wow, this controller comes to work every day. Uh, but it's, it's really great work. And where I have been focused, frankly, is on the internal operations of the office initially. When you think about, and Gina talked about my background, um, helping my parents with their business in San Francisco helping them essentially mine the store. And uh, this is how I feel uh, about the role of the controller. It's mining the store for the state of California. And to do that, I want to be sure that I have the highest level of capacity and capability uh, in terms of my uh, employees who are there doing the financial oversight, doing the financial reporting, and just really uh, taking care of all of our uh, financial risks uh, before they become crises. And so, uh, as I said, we are in a good position, but there are still things that happen relative to how uh, we manage our, our fiscal house at the state, more from a uh, management level, less from a, from a larger policy level. But uh, looking internally, I can tell you that um, uh, I, first of all, I brought in a uh, majority women senior staff, which I'm thrilled about because I actually can leave the office and know that things will be taken care of, that they are uh, serious uh, thinkers, they work collaboratively, and uh, I just can't be uh, more, uh, in some ways I feel like I've, I've, I've won a prize. It's just really, really wonderful to feel like uh, the executive office is in good hands. Uh, but secondly, um, we have a lot of risks uh, in this office, and um, I think you've been reading about some of them related to uh, technology projects. Uh, we also know that um, as we look at uh, certainly our baby boomer retirements, that uh, we're losing a lot of institutional knowledge 
And so we are losing a lot of our really talented uh, fiscal financial leaders in the state. So really putting plans together about how we're going to do succession planning, how we're going to build that bench. And uh, for any of the young people who are here, and frankly for anybody in this room, if you can get some fiscal and financial experience under your belt, do so. Not only will it serve you well in your own personal lives, but in whatever you do, those tools are going to be so, so helpful. And they will guide you. And so this is something that I'm uh, working a lot with with our local community colleges in Sacramento about how we can develop programs specific to public accounting and public finance and hope that we can start a track where we can attract more uh, young people uh, to the state uh, and be uh, financial leaders of the, of the future. Uh, the, the other thing I will say is that the, the policy uh, areas uh, I've been just so fortunate to be your rep representative on the State Board of Equalization. And we did so much work together, and I'm just so proud of the track record that we, uh, of accomplishments that we had uh, when I was on the tax board. And uh, I get to now continue to be on the board, uh, but have a broader reach now in terms of chairing the Franchise Tax Board. It is tax filing season, and so we hope that uh, you'll avail yourselves of uh, the resources that uh, we have at the Franchise Tax Board, as well as the Internal Revenue Service. If you run into any problems with tax filing, please call my office. Um, Stephen Jacobs is here. He has my cards, but we don't want anyone in tax trouble here. Uh, and there's always a solution that can be found. So uh, the worst thing that can happen with any kind of tax situation is sitting on it. So please, please call call my office. So we're in the height of tax filing season. It's going very, very well. We have tax clinics running all up and down the state, helping all of our uh, families in need apply for the earned income tax credit. And uh, through Nancy's leadership uh, when she was in the assembly, really, really having an earnest this year, a conversation about enacting a state version of the earned income tax credit. Uh, which is so, so important in terms of not only putting pockets, uh, putting money in the pockets of our uh, families in need, but also to help us really fully subscribe to the federal credit because we, we're leaving money on the table. And so uh, this is really, uh, if you know of any families who may qualify, you don't have to ha have a tax liability to even claim it's a refundable credit, please, please have them go into one of these uh, local volunteer income tax assistance centers and to get help or call my office uh, because California is uh, leaving a lot of money on the table and we know that there are families who could uh, really benefit from that. Uh, secondly, uh, I have been spending probably 80% uh, of my time focused on the public pension boards. And this is important from the perspective that uh, when we talk about retirement security, and particularly focus on our public sector workforce, uh, this is uh, a problem that's much bigger than how much we're going to have uh, in these funds to sustain benefits that uh, they have uh, worked to accrue. It's also about how we're going to be able to recruit and retain a workforce for our public sector going forward. And uh, having uh, a defined benefit plan, and I know there's going to be a reform measure that's qualifying for the ballot, that when we look at uh, what we're really talking about here, it wasn't that long ago that the private sector uh, really uh, rewarded workers with also a defined benefit plan. And uh, until Wall Street really uh, essentially uh, gave everybody a haircut, um, that was really the, the way that uh, retirement uh, benefits were provided in the private sector. That is no longer the case. And so obviously they're looking very, very enviously at the public sector. Uh, but I don't think we want to exacerbate, I don't think we want to exacerbate our inequality here by um, socking it to our retirees. And they are the most vulnerable in terms of retirement security. So we're going to do everything we can to be, to be smarter about how we allocate our assets. We're going to be smarter about how we keep our investment costs down how we can bring a lot of these uh, investment management um, activities in-house so that we don't have to pay huge fees to our external investment managers. Looking at being smarter about eventually, we're not there yet, eventually getting out of bad investments, and I would say including fossil fuel down the road, but we've got to, but we have got to up our, we have, but before we do that and create a big hole in our portfolio, we have got to really ramp up our renewables portfolio. And so I know all of us are committed to doing that in this room because Marin has been a leader in this uh, area and we want to be sure that uh, we create that uh, wonderful substitute that's going to really sustain our environment in the future uh, as well as our retirement por portfolio. Uh, and then uh, with respect to state teachers retirement system, uh, again, uh, this uh, last session 
uh, to have uh, finally a new funding formula for our CalSTRS system where uh, everyone is taking um, a responsibility, the state, our school district employers, as well as uh, the CalSTRS members are going to all be paying more into the system so that we can deal with that unfunded liability over the next 32 years. So uh, again, just uh, this is what it's going to take, some really, really tough decisions. But when we say retirement security, we want to be sure that we mean it and that it's there uh, for those who are ending their, at the end of their careers. And then lastly, uh, I've been uh, very fortunate to have my first State Lands Commission meeting. Um, and I'm thrilled about this particular area of uh, policy because uh, there is so much that we can do on the State Lands Commission to drive exactly what I've been talking about, the use of renewables on our public lands. The state ought to be leading by example in terms of how we model this ethic that it's uh, not a, uh, yes, there may be upfront costs in the initial uh, period, but we ought to be thinking about um, how we can uh, really have um, good sustainability practices being the ethic of how we do business relative to our state lands, not a burden. And so we're going to be working on that. I know Lieutenant Governor Newsom is uh, uh, certainly a, a proponent of that. He chairs the State Lands Commission this year. But uh, we are looking at every single lease that we're uh, doing with uh, uh, whether it's oil companies or others and really making that statement to them that one, uh, you need to start thinking about diversifying your business practice and two, uh, be sure that you are employing uh, people from the regions in which uh, you're um, shoring up facilities because there's been a uh, real proliferation of out-of-state workers taking care of our, our really sensitive uh, properties, including oil refineries and uh, uh, marine terminals and the like. So we want to be sure that uh, our own workers here in California have those jobs. So it's been an exciting first two months. Um, I am thrilled to be here to continue to do what I can to support uh, getting more women elected to office. But uh, I can't say enough about um, just over the past uh, 10 years now and more how much Marin County has meant to me in terms of uh, the great privilege I've had to represent it on the Board of Equalization and the great privilege that I've had to be a part of this uh, political network and uh, certainly uh, looking here to be a part of this great example of how Marin leads relative to uh, women leaders that not only are improving the quality of lives and communities here, but hopefully uh, will continue to elevate uh, to the state level and even nationally so that we can show that um, when we all focus and work hard when we all don't take any community for granted and that we are about lifting everybody up, that we can succeed and thrive and, and really mean when we say we want to be about expanding economic, economic opportunity for all. So uh, it's always uh, just a great pleasure to be here. Uh, to Gina, thank you for your leadership and to uh, very happy that Nancy's here because she is going to give you a, a really good view about uh, what's in store for us and really the work that we have to do, continue to do together. So uh, thank you all very much. I promise not to be a stranger and if you're in Sacramento, come see me. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Our keynote speaker today is Nancy Skinner, and uh, she is a social justice advocate, energy and climate, climate expert, and accomplished legislator. She recently completed three terms in the State Assembly representing the East Bay cities along the I-80 corridor from Hercules to Oakland. She chaired the, uh, the Rules and the Budget Committees, where she oversaw California's largest investment in early child care and education uh, for children um, in over a decade, and new funding to reduce prison recidiv recidivism. Practice that word. <laughs> her, success her successful legislation includes um, groundbreaking gun violence prevention required sales tax collection from Amazon and internet retailers, the rape kit bill that mandated evidence from sexual assaults to be entered into the national DNA database, and legislation to make food stamps more accessible to families. Uh, she began her public service in 1984 as the first and only Cal student to be elected to the Berkeley City Council. And uh, she's also served on the East Bay Regional Park District Board is a former small business owner and longtime advocate to increase women in elected office, having founded the Women in Power PAC that funds Democratic women running for state office. She's a graduate of UC Berkeley with a BS in the College of Natural Resources and has a master's in education. May we uh, applaud and put our hands together for, as they say, Nancy Skinner.
Gina, thank you. Got to talk right into it, right? You hear? Yeah. Great. Gina, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, Betty, thank you for all of your public service, but for being our controller now. And will you remind us, well, first, there are seven constitutional executive offices. The, and I'm, apologies, I'm not including the Board of Equalization there because I can't always keep track of how many people in that. But of our seven constitutional officers, we're talking governor, lieutenant governor, treasurer, controller, secretary of state, the insurance commissioner, and the superintendent of education, all right? So in the history of California, how many women, you're like the eighth? Yeah, all right. So those are, I just said those were seven offices They've existed since sometime in the 1800s. So you know there's got to have been over 200, uh, three, 400 of those people in those offices. Betty's only the eighth woman. So we applaud her for that. But we will say to ourselves, what is it that we have to do? More women. More women. And I note that in the opening of this, Betty pointed out that Marin County, you're great. You have many, many women in your local offices, your special districts. That's incredible. Now we need you to move on. And to our young women, we need you to start thinking about this. And you don't need to worry. You don't need to like set your sights. Okay, I'm going to be my uh, life, uh, whatever path is political office. You don't necessarily have to decide that. But you can certainly do lots of things that aren't so hard that set you up so that any time the opportunity is available, you jump for it. OK? And that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I also want to just give a little shout out. Uh, I didn't realize this about your organization, that you were, this Marin Women's PAC, was a former chapter of the National Women's Political Caucus in California, but then you decided to go independent and just support you know, folks here in Marin and keep your funds here. Well, obviously, you don't only support Marin, because I imagine you supported Betty. But the point being that you decided to have more autonomy over your own funds and your endorsements. Well, the chapter, I live in the East Bay, as was indicated. And the Northern Alameda County chapter of NWPC was the largest chapter in the state. And we were basically funding the state NWPC. And we thought, you know, not, again, I'm very glad the NWPC exists, but it wasn't serving uh, some of the things that our, the women in the East Bay were trying to accomplish. So they just went independent also. So yeah, and the, uh, and the Susan B. Anthony, which is the annual event that our women's group in Alameda County runs every year, will be honoring Betty this year, Yay. as well as Tony Atkins, who's the speaker of the state assembly, one of our few women speakers. Uh, she's the technically the third woman speaker, but really only the second woman speaker because one of the people we consider a woman speaker was there for a couple months. Um, anyway, so, so Tony is really only the second and the first woman uh, LGBT speaker. So anyway, so if you want to come over to East Bay and honor Betty and Tony and some other folks, you're welcome. Great, wonderful, excellent, very good. All right, so. Um, I have catered my remarks to a degree towards our young women because I started as a young woman. And I'll tell you a little bit about, about my pathway. So, you know, I grew up, uh, Betty and I have very similar family histories. I was born in San Francisco, though we moved to Southern California. I'm the second of nine, and my father was a small business owner. I worked in my father's store from when I was about eight years old until I left home to go to college. And of course, when I came home from college, I worked in my father's store. So, you know, that was just a norm. And if you were home, if I wasn't at his store, then at home I had obviously many responsibilities given that we lived in a household of 11 people. Um, but anyway, so did I um, set my paths on, oh, I'm going to be a politician when I grow up? No. <laughs> I don't know if I was really thinking about what I would be when I grew up. But I was in high school in the 70s, 
And I had never been in student government. And uh, my junior year, I think it was, maybe my sophomore year, there was uh, a girl. We, we referred to, we didn't call them young women then, a girl was running for student body president. And her name was Maya. Maya, there was never a girl had won as student body president at my high school. So the boys who were active in the student government, I was sitting with them at lunch one day, and they said, oh, Maya will never win. I'm like, why? Well, she's a girl. I'm like, so? And they're like, well, girls can't be president. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, unfortunately, she didn't win. But because those boys told me a girl can never be president, I ran for student body president the next time, even though I'd never been in student government. I won. So I was the first. And of course, in the, you know, then, shortly thereafter, women started breaking into various things. And of course, by the time, uh, you know, at different points in my life, we had got uh, our first woman Supreme Court justice, Sandra Day O'Connor, we got this, that, and the other. And I thought, all right, I don't have to worry about this anymore. I don't have to worry about women being first anymore. Not. Because sadly, we still have, if we look at corporate boards, very few women. If we look at elected positions, as it goes, we go up the ladder, very few women. Now I'll tell you a little bit about the state assembly. There are 80 members of the state assembly, 80. How many do you think are women right now? 14. Well, you guys are a little lower than real, but 19, 19. But still, out of 80, what's the demographics of the state? Women make up more than 50% of the state, and yet we're only 19 women. And of that, I think there's only uh, 12 or 13 Dems. There's a lot of Republican women in there. State Senate slightly better proportionately, but the irony here is because of the new term limits, which I think is better, we had too short of a time before, but now the people elected can serve for 12 years. So I have a chart, and I can't really show you that chart, but I'll tell you what that chart means. This chart shows that after 2016, which is the next race for state assembly, so the, the June and December primary, or June and November elections of 2016, where there will be a number of seats open. After that, if everyone in the assembly stays there 12 years, <clears throat> there will not be, excuse me, another assembly opening until 2024. Wow. So that means if we don't have a good number of women running and winning in 2016, we would be permanently at that under 20% of women in that role. And all of the data shows that women make a difference. We perceive issues differently when it comes to budget, and I was chair of the budget, when it comes to the budget discussions, we think about the investments in early care and education, the taking care of the zero to three kids, the babies, right? We think about the seniors. We think about the different safety net services. Why? Because think about your own lives. It's very often the women that are the caretakers of the different people in the family who need care, right? Whether they be little ones or seniors. And we're often the ones who manage the family household finances. Right? We do. And so we have a very different perspective on budgets. It's not that men are lesser elected officials. They just don't, they, we just bring perspectives that don't, aren't there unless we're there. So we need you there. So now, back to my story. Okay, so I became the first girl president of my high school, but still I didn't think about being in elected office. I go to college, I'm at Cal, UC Berkeley, and again, I wasn't involved in the student government, but I was incredibly fortunate to be in an environmental science major where the professors were very activist. And they pushed us into doing work in the community and uh, basically getting involved in environmental issues in the community. And so when I was a sophomore in college, I met one of my current mentors, who is the state senator from my area, Lonnie Hancock. And at that time, when I was just 19 years old, her then husband was one of my professors in this program. And she wanted, she was on the Berkeley City Council. This is again the 70s. And she wanted to stop the use of pesticides by the city of Berkeley. In those days, 
many, many cities, probably cities in Marin, Berkeley, the uh, city workers would drive up and down the street with these trucks and spray pesticides. No notice given, nothing, just spray pesticides, right? On the trees or wherever. Well, she wanted to stop that. The city staff said, oh, no, we can't, you know, that'll, if we stop using pesticides, all the trees will die. So she went to her husband, who was a plant pathologist, and she said, can you figure out what we could do instead? So, of course, us undergrads, we were the ones who were tasked with figuring out. Well, what did we figure out? that the pest they were spraying for was aphids. Well, aphids, all you have to do is spray water. And aphids go away if you use water. So we wrote up a report, we presented it to the city council. So now I'm you know, 19, 20 years old. And the city council then adopted an ordinance which stopped the use of pesticides in the city of Berkeley. First city in the country to do so. And then all of a sudden, other cities all over the US wanted to follow. But now we didn't have internet then. We didn't have email. So these cities would call uh, Senator Hancock, who was then council member, and she didn't have a big staff, and they would say, how did you do it? And you know, what's, your, what's the ordinance? So of course, we young students, undergrads, we're cheap labor. So cheap, we're free. <laughs> we ended up, we were asked by the professor to respond to these cities, to give them the information. So all of a sudden, not only is something that I worked on adopted by a city. It is then mimicked and adopted by cities all across the country. So I really started understanding, number one, the power of you know, what one person, especially joined together in a group, can do, but also the amount of impact that public service of that sort can have. So um, anyway, I still wasn't involved in uh, in any of the student government things until a few years later when I was a grad student. And I ended up running for student government as a grad student. And then, because I was still involved in the community issues, various people recruited me to run for the Berkeley City Council. So as a grad student at Cal, I ran for the Berkeley City Council and I was the first and only UC student ever to be elected to the Berkeley City Council and at that time was the youngest person elected. I bring up that story because notice, that important person, Lonnie Hancock, I met when I was an undergrad. She's still very important to me today. And the seat that I just got termed out of, my assembly seat, she held it before me. And she recruited me to run for it. So after my Berkeley City Council experience, I was only, you know, I was pretty young. I served in that role for eight years, but then I was out of office for 15 years because in those days, and it's still the case now, many of our um, elected roles, whether it be city council, school boards, or special districts, they don't have compensation associated with it. In other words, there's not a salary. And so at a certain point, I was a single mom raising my daughter, and the Berkeley City Council had no um, salary associated with it, and I needed to, I was always working full time, but it got to the point where I really, I couldn't juggle, in effect, that, um, that amount of voluntary service with my other responsibilities. So I bring that up because that's something we all have the ability to influence. One of the factors that impacts women going into office is the fact that very often the offices that are available have no remuneration, have no, so it's not so that the offices must have a salary, but we have to be creative. We have to think about what is the burden that we are placing on a person who gets into those type of roles? Is their childcare costs increasing? Are they not, are they losing health benefits? Maybe they're taking less time at their work and so maybe that puts them off their health benefits. Are there ways that we can structure these public service roles, whether they be school boards, community college boards, special districts, city councils, in ways that can support, maybe not give a full-time salary, but do more so that it's not such a burden on women to serve in those roles. That's very, very important because that's one of the factors that keeps us from coming in. And we have the ability to influence that, so I bring it up. So anyway, so I was out of office all those years, but then my you know, these important women that I had met young recruited me and asked me to run for assembly. So I ran and I won after being out of office for that many years. Pretty impressive. 
Um, and I don't mean pretty impressive to me that a guy did so well, it's just that these women believed in me so much, right, to take that risk. And I give that as an example because your viability, meaning your ability to win in a campaign, very often they'll tell you, well, you know, if you're not in a current office or if you haven't done this, that, or the other thing, you're not viable. Well, that's a kind of limited role. If you have, and this is the other point I want to make to our young women, keep your contacts up. Everybody who you are meeting, even in high school, in high school, in college, in your first job, in your internship, all of those people are going to at some point be important again to you. And they could play a very important role for you. So like, for example, when I ran for the assembly, I had to raise this amazing amount of money. And I'm like, oh, am I going to do that? I called everybody I ever met. I called people I knew from grammar school. I called people I knew from high school. I called people I knew from college. I called people who I babysat for. I called everybody I could think of. And that's the kind of thing that any of you are going to need. And that's what makes you politically viable, your willingness to do that kind of work, and that you have kept your networks up, and that you, you know, maybe you're involved in different community service, or, and that, there's ranges of that. But anyway, we won't have to go into all those details, but I just wanted to, to give you those sort of points to think about because there's many ways to keep your options open as you go through life. And there's also very important roles other than elected. So I think, Betty, you mentioned that your, uh, ch your main staff now or your key staff are women. That's very important too. And if you were to go up to the Capitol, to the Sacramento, and you were to go and visit many of your state senators or assembly members, you would be, I think, a little bit mm, disappointed, perhaps, that there are small number of women chiefs of staff. And again, a woman chief of staff also brings a perspective to the, the whole, you know, the chiefs of staff advise those elected officials. And then, of course, women chiefs of staff are well positioned to groom other women to be in those roles. So we need good women in every aspect of public service. Betty was a staffer before she was elected, right? So the staff role is a vehicle to get elected, but it's also an essential vehicle when we look at the way governments run. We need women city managers. We need women superintendents of schools. We need women chiefs of staff of every elected office. We need women uh, heads of special districts. So there are many public service roles that are very important and where you can do important and good <coughs> social change work or you know work that reflects your values um let's see what was the and another point i want to make before i close um money i mentioned that i was willing to call everybody well i'm very happy that this organization has a PAC because interestingly enough while you probably if you went up online or did a search you probably wouldn't find the national men's political PAC or the men's list, you know, versus Emily's list, or the this or that boys pack. In effect, almost every pack that doesn't have women in its name, well, I'm not trying to be too, too uh, generic here, but almost every one of those packs are a men's pack. If you look at their boards, there's men on their boards. If you look at who they direct their money to, very often, it's the male candidate. So we women, we have got to play more in politics. And one way to do it is through supporting women. And PACs like the one this organization has is very important. When I got into the assembly, and I, and I mentioned when I ran, there were only two women's entities that gave directly, explicitly women's organizations that gave me money. My chapter of the National Women's Political Caucus, which is now the East Bay one I mentioned, and Emily's List. Those were the only two. Well, the guy candidates that were running against me, they had all kinds of PACs that gave them money. So when I got into the assembly, I went to my women colleagues, Democrats in the legislature, I said, look, we gotta have a women's PAC that we raise the money for. So that's what WIP PAC is, Women in Power. 
and the women in the legislature raise money and they then give it to women, Democratic women, who are running for assembly, board of equalization, those uh, constitutional offices I mentioned, WIPPAC gave money to Betty, to state senate, so those state offices. But we need more of those. We need more. We need 25, 30, 40, 50, because there's limits on how much a PAC can give. So anyway, that's an important role too. And then of course, supporting women. Money isn't everything. It's important, but it's not everything. But Betty thanked many of the people who worked on her campaign that volunteering on campaigns and volunteering in campaigns is a great way to get exposed to all this stuff around politics. It's fun, it's crazy, but it's a great way to meet people, learn about it, and of course it's essential to getting our women elected because the more what we call street heat you have, and street heat is people willing to call on your behalf, people willing to go and knock on doors, people willing to staff your fundraiser, the more of that street heat that you have as a candidate, the more likely you will win. So I wanted to share those things and I wanted to thank you very much for inviting me. I intend now to run for the seat that my mentor and state senator Lonnie Hancock will be termed out of in 2016. So I will have to be jumping back into the campaign fray myself relatively soon. Um, and we fortunately already have announced, we know that Barbara Boxer, Marin native, Marin, or rather our Marin, uh, you know, she was Marin County Supervisor, moved on to, to our uh, Senate, but is now retiring. And we have Kamala Harris, who's announced right now the most viable candidate that's announced. So we have a good shot at replacing a woman with a woman, which is very important. But we have so many other offices that we need to start grooming women for. Who's gonna replace Jerry Brown when he stops as governor? Who's gonna replace you know, Lieutenant Governor uh, Newsom when he's termed out as Lieutenant Governor? Who's gonna replace Senator Feinstein? So, back women, young women who are, as you start in your paths, keep your options open. And again, thanks so much.